Доброго дня всі учасники лекції. Сьогодні ми зустрілися, щоб взяти участь в лекції за програмою «Визначні лектори СПІ». До нас приїхав доповідач з Сполучених Штатів з університету Монтани і його доповідь на тему підвищення нафтовилучення пласта нетрадиційних покладів звати Тед Хофман, доповідь на англійській мові, однак ви після лекції маєте можливість на українській мові задати питання по презентації, перекладач перекладе на англійську мову і таким чином може бути спілкування стосовно доповіді. А доповідь буде на англійській мові. Окей. Дякую дуже. this topic where we're going to talk about both enhanced oil recovery, and I'll explain what enhanced oil recovery is in a little bit, and we'll also talk about unconventional reservoirs. And I'll really start kind of by focusing on uh, what are unconventional reservoirs, how are they different than conventional reservoirs. Um, and just for a quick outline, uh, I'll actually even start kind of talking about how reservoirs are formed. Uh, how they were you know, originally formed and then go into how we're developing these unconventional type reservoirs. And then I'll spend most of the talk talking about uh, enhanced oil recovery or EOR in these types of reservoirs. Kind of along the way, I will also talk a little bit about my background, where I've worked, 
what my experience is, uh, and then we'll end up talking a little bit about the future of enhanced oil recovery uh, in these types of uh, in these types of reservoirs. So to get started, let's just talk about how reservoirs were formed. So a long, long time ago, um, small particles of clay and silt um, were um, transported from the the uh, land into the ocean and if they're small the small pieces of clay and and silt made it out to this deep marine area uh, because the velocity is very slow out there the water is moving very slowly so those pieces can start to fall down to the bottom um, of the ocean floor if we were fortunate it was also very warm climate we generate a lot of organic material plankton algae uh, lots of you know green material that's also at the same time falling down with the small particles and basically over time these other f uh, formations the reefs the beaches the deltas they push out over this deep marine area and they build up over time and it makes increased pressure in the deep marine and it also uh, increases the temperature so after you know tens of millions of years of that process uh, that organic material that was deposited with the small particles uh, converts into hydrocarbons so the high temperature high pressure um, is allows that to convert into the hydrocarbons that we produce so that's actually this deep marine part is actually the source rock it's where hydrocarbons came from when those hydrocarbons were generated there was a volume increase so with that volume increase it makes the pressure even higher and it forces the oil forces the hydrocarbons to leave and collect in these conventional reservoirs so over the last hundred years we have been developing these conventional reservoirs by drilling wells into them you know, producing them um, but those types of reservoirs at least in the united states but across the world are running out and no matter how much hydrocarbon has left these source rocks even more has remained in there maybe 10 percent has left 90 percent of that is still remaining in there in these source rocks so even when we were producing our conventional reservoirs we maybe drill through the source rocks maybe we're trying to get to a formation that's down here deeper we would see small uh, hydrocarbon production from these source rocks but it was never enough to be economic to make money um, but someone you know a 10 20 years ago 2000 they said well maybe if we drill the horizontal well into this source rock then we could get enough production out of these wells to make them economic remember the particles the, the make up the sand and clay are very very tiny so the permeability in this source rock is very very low micro darcy's or nano darcy's like 0 0.00001 millidarcy's so very very low permeability in these types of reservoirs and we really couldn't produce them at all until we drilled these long horizontal wells and did something else which was a multi-stage hydraulic fracture so we go in there and we put in a hydraulic fracture first at the toe of the well we just we separate that portion of the well we perforate then we frack that zone then we come to the next zone we isolate that we perforate it we pump fluids and sand down there and and frack that zone and we do that maybe originally maybe three or four times it, today we may be doing that 60 times per well so this well uh, originally maybe was I don't know 400 meters long now those wells are typically 3,000 meters long so 3,000 meters we're doing 60 40 60 80 stages of hydraulic fracture to really break up that low permeability rock and allow the hydrocarbons to produce into the into the wells so you may hear I mean I call the unconventional reservoirs you may hear it called shale oil or or shale gas or sometimes you'll hear them called source rock reservoirs or hard to produce reservoirs there's lots of names that kind of describe these types of reservoirs but for this presentation today I'm going to really try to 
I'm going to call them unconventional reservoirs. And part of what describes them is this low permeability, the fact that it's the source rock. But really, my definition, what I think really is the definition, what, what defines an unconventional reservoir, is the way we have to produce that reservoir. So that requires drilling long horizontal wells and doing multi-stage, multiple hydraulic fractures along the well to try to uh, get the hydrocarbons to produce both gas hydrocarbons, gas reservoirs, and liquid reservoirs. We can produce both of those using these types of unconventional reservoir development. Does that make sense? Is everybody kind of on page for understand what I'm talking about for unconventional reservoirs? OK. Um, so that's what unconventional reservoirs are. Where are unconventional reservoirs? Well, because they're the source rocks for our conventional reservoirs, um, they're basically everywhere. Everywhere we have conventional reservoirs, there's also unconventional reservoirs associated with those. They're also in the same locations. Um, they've only really been exploited. They've only been drilled and produced primarily in the United States and Canada maybe for 20 years, been producing in those areas. Um, in other places, China, uh, uh, Argentina, down here in South America, and a little bit in Russia, maybe the last three or four or five years, they've been drilling wells and producing them. Uh, in other parts of the world, you know, here maybe even in Ukraine, they've only been doing this kind of production for the last you know, year or two. It's kind of a newer area, but it, they exist everywhere. So everywhere in the, the world that we have hydrocarbon reservoirs, we also have unconventional reservoirs. We have the potential to have unconventional reservoirs. Um, and so just to um, talk a little bit about Ukraine, right? This is where we are in Ukraine. Um, the location of these unconventional reservoirs, kind of maybe three areas. I don't have this one highlighted, but there's kind of three areas of production. Um, and both of these locations have some potential for oil. So there's some oil portion of that, uh, of that uh, unconventional formations and some natural gas portion of that formation, depending on how deep the reservoirs are, how hot the temperature got, how high the pressure got. Sometimes it converts into the organic material into liquids like oil. Sometimes it converts into to gas. So, um, you know, this is just a, a very quick kind of um, Google search, let's say, of the uh, unconventional reservoirs in Ukraine. But I'd be interested, particularly afterwards, if we want to have more discussion about what are the unconventional reservoirs here in Ukraine. That would be very, I, I'd love that. That would be very, uh, very interesting for me. Um, but back to the, to the North America. Most of the development, as I said, has happened in Canada and the US. And really, all of these dark blue uh, fields are locations where there have been hydrocarbon production from unconventional reservoirs. Um, we're going to really focus on two of them. Two of them, one is the Bakken. We'll talk about that first. That's up here in North Dakota, Montana, and a little bit into Saskatchewan and Canada. I'm from Montana, so here's the state of Montana where I'm from. So we'll talk a little bit about, about that. Um, then the other one we'll talk about is the Eagleford. Uh, the reason I want to really focus on these two places is they're the locations where we've been producing hydrocarbons from unconventional reservoirs for the longest. So some of these started in the early 2000s, 2005, 2010. And so those are the places that are the most ready for some type of enhanced oil recovery. OK, so let's talk about Montana. So back in 1999, there was a, this guy, he was just a geologist, had this idea. He'd been drilling through this Bakken formation to get to deeper zones his whole career. And he thought, oh, man, if I could come in and drill a horizontal well into this, maybe I would get some additional production. So he convinced a company called Lyco to invest some money with him. Uh, they went and they drilled this well in 1999. And the well started producing about 100 barrels a day, which was pretty good. Typical wells about that time were maybe making 20 barrels a day. So it was a nice improvement. Still, the economics of doing just a horizontal well may be kind of marginal, uh, maybe good, maybe not so good. Um, so then his second idea was, well, could we go in and hydraulically fracture this well? 
So he went in and he didn't do uh, multiple stages. He just pumped a bunch of uh, sand down the well, sand and, and fluids, and tried to break the rock up as much as, much as he could. Um, and then turn the well back on. Now the well was making about 400 barrels a day, which was definitely economic. There was a, a lot of opportunity to, um, to uh, make money at 400 barrels a day. Um, so he, his company, him and his company, they dr started drilling additional wells. Other companies that, had, that owned leases nearby also started drilling wells with the same style, hydraulic fracturing. Pretty soon they started putting in two fractures per well, then four fractures four fractures per well, and, um, and by 2005, they had really drilled a pretty extensive portion uh, of this Elm Cooley field, this unconventional reservoir that's in Montana. So my story is that, so in 1999, I also graduated with my bachelor's degree from Montana Tech, um, and my friends and I, we knew that we weren't gonna work in the continental US here because all the oil fields have been found, they're all very old, very low producing, nothing exciting going on there. So if we were going to work in the oil industry, we would have to work international or offshore Gulf of Mexico, but really nothing going on in the, in the continental US. So I went to work for a company called Anadarko in Houston. Uh, Houston was very hot, very big city. Um, I don't know, it wasn't a good fit for me so I had an opportunity to go to graduate school in California, out here in California, uh, where the climate is better and the lifestyle is better. So I went to California and I did my master's and my PhD there. And when I finished my PhD, I kind of thought I would go work in the industry. I'd go to work for Chevron or Exxon or some company like this. But there was an opening for a professor back in Montana where I came from and specifically for reservoir engineering, which is kind of my uh, area of specialty. So we went back to Montana. I started teaching there. And really, the, the world had changed. There was a big push now for this unconventional development. Not all over the US, but in Montana. In Montana, that's all anybody wanted to talk about was this Elm Cooley field and this unconventional development. And, and it was a very exciting time. Um, if we go forward another five years to 2010, the development moved across the border. Here's Montana and North Dakota and Canada. But over here now, much of the new wells were being developed in on the other side of the border in North Dakota. In Montana, much less going on. Actually, each one of those circles uh, represents a well. The size of the circle is how much oil they're producing, and the color is how much gas. So green is low gas, red is high gas. And you can see the wells over here in Elm Cooley now. Circles are much smaller, producing a lot more gas. So they're not, you know, not nearly as good um, as the wells over in North Dakota. Um, also at this time, uh, U.S. was in a small recession. So my hometown, where I grew up, it's not close to an oil field. It's far, you know, a thousand kilometers from any oil field. Uh, the, the students that I graduated high school from, they didn't have any idea what a petroleum engineer was. They didn't know what I was doing for my, for my, um, for my career. Um, but in 2008, 2009, 2010, many of them started going to North Dakota and getting jobs. Now these people, there's no, they have no, uh, college degree, no education, but they could get a good paying job basically working in the, in the oil fields. Um, and, uh, when I came home, my, mo my mom, like I came home for Christmas or something, my mom asked me like one day, just out of the blue, you know, she's a school teacher, she grew up on a, raising cattle on a ranch, but like no connection to the oil industry. She was like, you know, how do you drill a well horizontal anyways? And I'm just like, blew my mind that my mom, who's this kind of simple school teacher, knew enough to ask me how to drill a well horizontal. And I tried to explain to her, you know, you just, you turn a little bit, you know, every foot, and pretty soon you're going horizontal. But I don't know, I don't know if she got it. But, but the point is that the really the world had changed. Now there was a lot of potential to work in the oil fields in the continental U.S., like all over. Um, and you know, my friends were doing it. My even my mom knew about it. Uh, and just to kind of finish my story, so in 2005, 
or not 2005, in 2008, my, my wife, she's a geophysicist by trade, but didn't ever really practice geophysics, decided she wanted to be a medical doctor. So she applied to medical school, got accepted out here in, in Washington. So we moved out to Washington for three years. Uh, I worked for a consulting company focused on naturally fractured reservoirs, um, kind of, again, all over the world. And then when she finished her medical school, she has to do residency, like a practical training. She did that in Colorado. So this uh, state here is Colorado. So I went there and lived for a few years. I worked at a different university, Colorado School of Mines, which also has petroleum engineering. And then when she finished up in 2014, we moved back to, um, back to Montana. And I've been teaching back at Montana Tech for the last six years. And so that's mostly, most, that's basically all of my story. So the rest of the presentation will be kind of technical. Um, so I said we were talking about two locations. We talk about the Bakken. So we've talked about the Bakken a little bit. The other area that I want to talk about is the Eagle Ford. So this is in 2011, and this is the Eagle Ford down here in Texas. And it's the next, in time, it's the next location that had lots of unconventional development, horizontal wells and uh, hydraulic fracturing. The blue wells here are permitted. They have not been drilled yet. So in 2011, there are very few wells drilled in the Eagle Ford. Uh, the red are some gas wells. There's a few green oil wells. But for the most part, there was hardly any wells drilled. By 2015, they basically had, just had drilled up this entire acreage. And as of today, they've drilled over 18,000 wells into the Eagle Ford formation. It's a huge, huge development that they're, that they're having there. Um, and why, I guess, the reason why this is so big in the United States has to do with this plot. So this plot is showing oil production in barrels, in millions of barrels per day from the United States from 1920 uh, until today. And US production peaked in 1970, right at uh, 10 million barrels per day and had been on a pretty much steady decline for 30, 40 years. Um, this little blip here was Alaska, when Alaska oil came on, but it's been pretty straight down. Then in 2010, with all these new unconventional reservoirs coming on, the Bakken, the Eagle Ford, other places like the Permian, um, the Niobrara, these oil production rates have just skyrocketed in the last 10 years. And now we're up over 12 million barrels a day. So exceeded our peak from 1970 just in the last 10 years. Um, and that's all from unconventional oil recovery. I mean, that's all from, yeah, unconventional oil reservoirs. Um, and this volume of oil, the oil in place in these unconventional reservoirs is just tremendous. I mean, hundreds of billions of barrels in each one of these formations, really a trillions of barrels overall in North America between the Canada and the US. Just to give you an idea how much that is, total that we've produced in the whole world is about one trillion barrels, just a little over a trillion barrels. So everything that we've produced, we have more of that in these unconventional reservoirs in, in US and, and Canada. So that's the good news. We have lots of hydrocarbons. They exist everywhere we have conventional reservoirs. Um, What's the deal about enhanced oil recovery? Why do we need to worry about enhanced oil recovery? Well, while these wells have high rates, they, those rates drop off very quickly. So they may start at 1,000 barrels a day. Within a year or two, they're below 100 barrels a day. Uh, so you have to continue to drill new wells to keep this, these rates higher. Uh, the second problem is that there's very low recovery factors. So there may be 100 billion barrels, but we're only getting maybe 5, 6, 8 percent of the oil out, which means we're leaving 90, 95 percent of the oil in the ground. Um, and so our, you know, let's go back and talk about my mom again, right? When I go home and talk to my mom about, you know, we're this good industry, she, I'm a professor, so she, you know, she thinks, oh man, my son, that, he's a professor, he's this really good. I go home and I tell her, yeah, we're doing a great job. We're able to get 5% of the oil out. Right? That's embarrassing for me. It's embarrassing that we can't have higher rates of recovery than what, um, than just 5 or 10%. So, well, what do we need to do? What do we need to do to increase the recovery to something higher than just 5 or 8%? Well, what we need to do is enhanced oil recovery. So we've been doing enhanced oil recovery 
in our conventional reservoirs, those higher permeability reservoirs, uh, for a long time, 50, 60, 70 years. Basically, enhanced oil recovery means we're injecting something in one well to try to increase the production in the other wells. Right? That's, the, that's the whole idea. We need to inject something into our reservoirs. What we inject, what are the things we inject, kind of fall into three categories. They can be either a gas, some type of gas, typically uh, CO2, but can also just be natural gas um, or nitrogen. Uh, the second category is um, kind of chemical floods, so surfactants, polymers, even just water. Water injection, if you want to consider that as an enhanced oil recovery method, is, uh, is the second category. The third category is um, thermal methods. So steam injection that we've typically used for very heavy, very viscous, uh, thick oils. Um, but it may have some application in the unconventional reservoirs. Uh, and we may be able to talk about that again a little bit at the end if there's some, some questions about, about how to do that. So we're going to really focus on gas. We'll talk a little bit about water and surfactants in this presentation. But most of what's happened in the field has been, has been, um, has been gas related. So the the first really applicate like in Montana, we saw this kind of high rates dropping off quickly, low recovery factors a long time ago. You know, 2008, 2007, 2006, we started to see this in our in the in the Montana field, this Elm Cooley field, um, and we had a student who had a had an internship, a, a summer job with one of these companies that was developing fields in in Montana, and his project for the summer was to look at how to do enhanced oil recovery in these unconventional reservoirs. And he got really excited about it. He thought, man, this is a great idea. And he decided that he wanted to do his master's research on this area. And so what he did was he took a small portion of this Elm Cooley field. He built a reservoir simulation model in Eclipse. And then he tried out a bunch of different things, gas injection, water injection, uh, continuous floods, huff and puff, kind of a whole bunch of surfactants, tried a bunch of different things. And, and his general conclusion was, you know, there's, there's lots of potential. Uh, I mean, looking back now, there's things we would do different in the model. We, I, I can see a lot of mistakes that we made, things we could have done differently. But generally, it says, hey, there is some potential. There's some idea that this may improve our overall uh, recovery from this field. And really, it's the first, his uh, master's thesis, and the SPE paper that went along with that, really the first papers that were published uh, about enhanced oil recovery in unconventional type reservoirs. Um, so those companies that he worked for, they also set, saw the value in it, and they decided to test it in the field. So two different companies, one in North Dakota and one in Montana, just tried injecting CO2 into the reservoir to see if they could get some additional recovery. And the way they injected it was they um, trucked in truckloads of CO2 and pumped it into the reservoir. So they couldn't get a huge, the volumes were pretty small um, that they injected, the rates were low. Um, and really what they saw was they didn't get much additional, very small inc increase in production. Um, a little bit here. And so it wasn't very um, successful in recovering more oil, which is what we want to do in enhanced oil recovery. But we learned a lot about how to do injection. There is uh, uh, injectivity, how easy it is to inject the hydrocarbons in, or in the, inject the gas into the hydrocarbon reservoir was uh, a question that many people had. Remember the permeability of these reservoirs is very, very small. It's micro darcies, maybe nano darcies. So some people said, well, you couldn't even inject. There's no way you could inject into these reservoirs because the permeability is too low. Well, at least these two early pilots, these testing in the field, showed that you could inject something. There's no problem injecting you know, one to two million standard cubic feet per day. Um, but then there was kind of a, a small break in the um, uh, in the field trials, but other things were still going on. People in the universities uh, were working on uh, some lab testing, and there were also some people in companies and universities doing uh, reservoir modeling, uh, reservoir flow simulation, kind of testing thing for the next few years. So the next couple slides just talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, if these rocks, 
these uh, unconventional reservoirs, if they're water wet, then they're going to have more attraction for the water than the oil. So if you put water next to these formations, the water will go in and the oil will come out. So that's one of the ideas to increase production. And so here's a test where you just took a sa sample. This is a Bakken sample um, where you just immersed it in water and the water is going in and the oil you can see starting to come out. Here's a similar type example where the water is on the bottom and you can see the water basically over time imbibing up into the reservoir, going into the reservoir and oil basically coming out. So the oil is coming out the same place the water is going in and this kind of counter current um, flow. So anyways, there's some lab work there. But most of unconventional reservoirs are oil wet or more oil wet because they're made up of uh, organic material and clay. And clay particles and organic material tend to be more oil wet than, than water wet. So one of the things that surfactants can do is convert rock or at least make rock more water wet, less oil wet. So there's been some work people were doing to try to uh, use surfactants to increase recovery. And so again, I've shown some of those basically trying to uh, increase the ability to recover um, oil from those types of reservoirs. And then uh, there's also a lot of work going on with gas, seeing how easy it is for the gas to, dis to dissolve into the oil or how if you're injecting gas, how's it going to flow through the core. Um, so a lot of a lot of work going on, but the again one of the main points is that uh, the methods we had to test for conventional reservoirs don't work in unconventional reservoirs. They're just too complicated. The permeabilities are too low. It's really driven by the fractures that are in the that we've created with this multi um, this multi uh, step hydraulic fracturing. So we had to change a lot of the experiments that we did to try to um, to capture some of this behavior. And then with the modeling, you know, there's been a number of, of papers. I just went quickly and looked at the SPE website to see how many uh, uh, papers were on modeling EOR in unconventional. And there's a large number of them. And they generally kind of showed, you know, again, kind of like we talked about with Shabazz's paper earlier, some success. We're seeing additional oil production. But the question is, is that really capturing what's happening in the field? Because most models, if you're, if you're doing flow simulation, you, you, need to, you need to validate, you need to match that model to some field data. But we don't have any field data to really test it on. So we don't really know how good or bad these, uh, these models are. But starting kind of again, maybe 2010, 11, 12, we started doing some more testing in the field. And so I'm going to talk again about the Bakken and some field testing there, and then the Eagleford and some field testing there. So in the Bakken, there were eight different pilots. Pilots just means a field test, um, some with water, some with gas, uh, some with surfactants, some CO2, some natural gas, so a, a large variety of uh, injection types. Um, and I'm just going to talk about one of those pilots today because I think this one ha can tell us a lot about some things that are going on. So it's in North Dakota, and there were three wells in the pattern, um, and they were all producing on primary for some amount of time, you know, a few years, four, five, six, seven years, um, and that's what I'm showing here. Um, then they took the middle well, and they said, okay, we're going to inject water into this middle well. We're going to try to push the oil to these two offset wells by injecting down this middle well. And what happened was, and this is I'm showing this well here is this producer on the left. This well here comes from this. This is the production coming from the well to the right. Um, and so when they started injecting in this middle well, they just produced a lot of water at both of these wells and really no additional oil production. So that's exactly what we don't want, right? You don't want, we want more oil uh, and, and less water. So, well, we think about what happened. The way we developed this well was that we drilled a long horizontal well, then we put in these big fractures that connected up our injection well and our producing well. So when we inject water, it goes into this fracture and then it, um, and then it goes strictly, quickly over to the producer and it doesn't have any, it's not pushing the oil um, from the uh, injector to the producer. 
So they tried some different things. They tried a second injection, but really no additional oil happening. Um, but they didn't give up. They tried one more thing. They injected some gas, some just some natural gas that they had uh, nearby uh, for a couple months into that middle well. And they maybe saw a little bump in oil production in this well. This well, they saw that gas breaking through. But um, it, gave, it gave them enough hope or confidence, um, you know, enough success that they said, okay, maybe this is something we can try somewhere else or some other places. Um, and so the other thing it gave us, it gave us some data now that we can match, we can validate, we can test our models against this data to see how good our models are. So that's what we did. We built the model of that same area. So here are the three wells. Here are the reservoir properties. We modeled the, those hydraulic fractures uh, in a dual porosity grid. Not, not really important. We were able to capture the behavior of the injection um, in our model. So we can see that breakthrough happening when we injected water and then the gas, we can also see that. We can match that in our model. So it gives us some, some confidence uh, that our models are good and we can use those models to do some type of prediction. Um, and so we did some prediction with these models and I, we tried the first thing, what they did was just inject into that middle well and see what happened. But when they injected into the middle well, it just, um, the water went through these fractures and we had very little additional oil production. So that's all, this is the black line here. This line here is when we just produce all three wells and we don't do any injection. And then these cases below are when we try to inject into the middle well and produce from these offset wells. So the third thing we tried, and this takes a little a moment to explain, was something called huff and puff. So, you know, in the 1970s and 80s, in heavy oil reservoirs, we inject steam into a well, and then the steam heats up the, the heavy oil near the, near the well bore, uh, lowers the viscosity, and then they take that same well and you produce it back. So here's a case where we inject into a well and we produce back from that same well. And you inject, and then pretty soon the rates go down, so you inject again, produce back from that. So it's a repeated process of injecting and producing. Um, and it's sometimes called cyclic steam, but also kind of called huff and puff. So it's kind of like, you know, sucking and, and, and blowing out of the well bore until you recover that. So someone had the idea that you could do the same thing in these unconventional reservoirs, um, but instead of using steam, we use just gas. So instead of injecting into the middle well, we inject into all three wells for some amount of time. One month, two months, three months, and then we turn around and we produce those wells for some amount of time. Two months, four months, six months, something like that. And then we start injecting again. And we looked at a number of different sensitivities. We looked at water and natural gas. We looked at changing the injection rates, uh, the time that we did it, how quickly we switched back and forth. And all of those cases that did huff and puff saw an increase in production over primary. Um, and it's not a huge amount, but maybe an additional 20% of, of the hydrocarbons uh, when you do this huff and puff method. So again, that may be a thing, something we can try out in the Bakken and, and, um, and have some success. Um, so the Eagle Ford, uh, there's also a lot of pilots going on there. And in this particular case, they, they're, I don't know, over 12 pilots, they all have done this huff and puff process. So they've all used this, we're injecting gas into the reservoir and it's always, nat it's, in this case, it's always natural gas. It doesn't have to be, you could use CO2 or, or nitrogen, but in this case, they're all natural gas, just to produce gas that we have. Um, and there's been five or six different companies that have tried it in the field today, you know, and across kind of a big region. So this here across this whole area there is maybe 300 kilometers. So, you know, this is the, and maybe, you know, I don't know, 30 or 40, maybe 80 kilometers this direction. So there's a lot of, each one of those stars represents a trial. And they, um, uh, anyways, have had some success. We'll talk about a few of those. Um, there's this company called EOG, and they uh, were the first ones to try this method in the Eagle Ford. And their, their um, CEO, the, the president of the company, had a, a, um, investor relations presentation. So it's not a technical presentation. It was just to kind of to Wall Street, right, to the, the money, the bankers that are um, 
that are f helping their company and said, hey, he said, hey, we have this new process, huff and puff gas injection in our unconventional reservoirs. It's working great. He doesn't show any data. He just shows us one plot, which is just kind of a, of a cartoon, just a hand drawing of how much additional oil they get from, the, from this process. And they're saying we're going to get about, you know, 50% more oil. So if typically our wells produce 600,000 barrels, now we're going to get 900,000 barrels. Uh, and so personally, I was a little skeptical. I'm like, oh, man, that's, um, that's probably just try to increase the stock price or, you know, he's just kind of telling a story, but I don't know how true this is. So I was saying this for a few months, and finally one of my friends said, hey, well, why don't you just go get the data and look? Because in the U.S., all the production data is public. You can go to the uh, website of each individual state, in this case, Texas. You can go to the Texas website and download all the production data. So I went and found the oil rates from one of these, from these wells, and you can see here's this a case where they have a single well where they tried this. So the well came on on primary production, making 700 barrels a day, but quickly dropped off. So then they did some injection for a month or so, then the wells rates went back up to 400 barrels a day. Then it started to drop off again, so they did a second injection uh, for a couple months, and then the rates went back up to 300 barrels a day. And it really showed that there's some additional production can happen from injecting gas into this reservoir. So this company, EOG, had, was so happy about the, what the success they had there, they decided, let's try this at some other locations. So they went to some other locations that are close by, and they um, tried it here. In this case, there were 14 wells, and in this case over here, there were eight wells. Um, and the, the purple line here, that I f that's just a line I fit through the production data. So that's just a line I put in there um, that shows how the wells would have continued to produce. That's just a harmonic decline curve uh, if those wells would have continued to produce on primary. And you can see that once they started injecting, they got a lot more oil production. 1,000 barrels a day versus 400 barrels a day. And I think even more interesting on this pilot, they stopped injecting gas after a while. And when they stopped injecting, it didn't just go back to this purple line. It actually made a new decline. So that indicates that we're not just getting the oil out faster. We're actually getting oil out that we would have otherwise not got. Oil that would have been trapped under primary production, we're able actually to produce using this huff and puff gas injection method. And then the last um, case I'll show from the Eagleford is this one because this data is very clean. There's four wells in this pattern. They inject into all four wells and then they produce back from all four wells. So when they're injecting, the wells are all shut in. And then when they're producing, all the wells are producing. Um, in this particular case, uh, it's probably one of the more successful ones. You know, the wells start at 400, and in their first cycle, they got back to 250 uh, barrels per day. And they show that just in three years of injecting, they recover an additional 30% of the oil. So not quite the 50%, but even in the first, just this three years, they get 30% back. And because this data is so good, the quality is so good, we're able to predict some things. So we did some decline curve predictions of the future of Huff and Puff, if we did this out for additional 20 years, um, then that case we would get to the 50% recovery, additional recovery. And that's assuming a couple things, assuming we inject for two months, produce for two months, um, and that the, that the um, production continues to decline following the same kind of decline curve. Uh, also, because the data was so good, we're able to do some economic analysis. So we had some information about what's the additional cost. The main cost is a compressor. So we have to put a big compressor. It's this, you know, half the size of this room. So it's a huge compressor to inject 2 million standard cubic feet a day per well, or about 8 million per, for that whole, for those four wells. So that it requires a really big uh, compressor and it's also injecting around 8,000 psi. So it's a um, and there's some other economic stuff here. Uh, what you know, operating costs and and gas prices and and stuff. But the the answer is the short answer is that the economics are kind of at fifty dollars a barrel. This is kind of where we were at the time, marginal economic. You're making money, but you're not making a huge amount of money. Um, at sixty-five dollars, you're making a lot more. Um, 
But realize this is just a trial, a field trial. This is not the optimized technique, right? They haven't optimized the injection rates, the time when they start, the, um, the, the how long you inject and produce for. So all those things will improve the economics over time. Um, they waited for a long time before they started injecting. So there's a big, you know, if they'd have started injecting back here, they might not need as much gas to get back up to the pressures they needed to get to. Um, so, you know, while the economics aren't fantastic, they look pretty good. Um, enough, again, that they've been developing this kind of across the field. So they've done another, I don't know, eight pilots, uh, 150 to 200 wells today that they're um, using this method on. And so they're having some success. Other companies have started doing it as well. Kind of similar kind of response, like we recover more oil, for sure. The economics of it are, again, kind of questionable. It's probably better to drill a new well if you have acreage to drill a new well. But if you're running out of acreage to drill a new well, then this method is, is probably uh, becomes more economic. Um, and you know it's early. It's really early in the in the process, but the early indications are very encouraging. It's very promising that this might be something that can be implemented um, in other places, not just in the Eagleford. Uh, they're trying it this method in the Bakken today as we speak, um, but it's still early. We may decide that um, surfactants work best in. Niobrara or in Canada or wherever we are, maybe we want to do a huff and puff with water. I mean, there's lots of options. It's still kind of early, but there's, um, but um, anyways, it, it's kind of looks, it looks uh, promising. Uh, there's still a lot of things we don't understand. So one of the questions that people have is ha what's happening in the reservoir that's causing more oil to be produced? Like physically, what are, what's the physics that's causing when you inject gas into this reservoir, uh, more oil to be produced. So that's actually what we've been working on for the last 12 months or so in, in my research group is really focusing on trying to understand the recovery mechanisms, like the cause of that re uh, recovery. So um, again, that's, I won't go into that. I don't have any slides on that today, so I won't go into that. But um, um, so again, if we look across the globe, most places are still in kind of primary production for unconventional or, or we haven't even developed them, right? This technology of using long horizontal wells, multi-stage fracturing, we need to develop that first. Uh, figure it out different locations, have maybe different techniques that need to be done, that need to be learned on primary recovery. Uh, a few places like the US and Canada, we're ready to start implementing this enhanced oil recovery, these other methods. Um, but the rest of the world will also, you know, continue to, uh, uh, as they progress to be able to implement some of these enhanced oil recovery methods uh, for their uh, unconventional reservoirs. So just kind of a quick conclusion slide. Uh, I think the potential is, is really huge. Uh, there's lots and lots of oil in these reservoirs and they uh, our recovery factors are really low. So we're leaving a lot of the oil behind. In the Eagleford, so in South Texas where most of the work has been done, Huff and puff gas injection with natural gas, with just our produced gas, seems to be the most effective method. As of today, it's definitely technically recovering more oil. Uh, the economics of it is 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 also positive. Um, other basins, it's still early. You know, we may find that huff and puff gas injection works best everywhere, or maybe some areas require some different technology, and that's going to, you know, be up to young researchers and, and and engineers coming out and working in that area. The worldwide potential is is huge, but still, still, um, lots of lots of work to be done, lots of things for for young smart engineers like yourselves to to uh, continue to work on. So I want to end by thanking the SBE Foundation and Offshore Europe for providing the funding for me to travel all over the world. I'm kind of on my fourth stop and my fifth, uh, and I have a five-stop tour in Eastern Europe. This time I spent two weeks in Russia in uh, September. I'm doing two weeks in South America in, 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 in February. Um, and then also if you want to give some feedback, you can go to this website uh, so that I can improve my presentation for the next groups. There may be some kind of small prize you can win if you fill out the evaluation form that's there. So with that, I will um, end my presentation and open up to any kind of questions or comments or feedback that you, you have. So thank you.
Ну, що ж, дякую дуже за вашу презентацію. Якщо в когось є питання, підніміть руку, я, але одне питання, я буду підносити мікрофон, тому що у нас трансляція, щоб ваше питання теж звучало і на українській, і зразу перекладач буде перекладати на англійську. То прошу піднімати руку. It's close to the front. So it's mostly the number of wells. So you can see this plot is declining. Here's 2005, right? So that's kind of, if we go back a couple slides, the when the Bakken was started was maybe 2005, but um, that's a very small location. So once they started adding other places like, um, like the Eagleford, um, and there's other fields that were coming on, Niobrara, was coming on. So m most of that has to do with the total number of wells increased from 2005 to 2010 and then 2010 to 2008 um, uh, till 2019 we've probably drilled and this is maybe just an estimate but maybe 50 or 60,000 wells in the US in unconventional reservoirs <coughs> between all of these formations. So <coughs> Такий різкий зріст видобутку був завдяки тому, що з 2005 по 2010 рік збільшилась кількість світловин в цих місцевостях. І з 2010 року було приборено біля 50-60 тисяч світловин. Ось завдяки кількості нових світловин і було різке збільшення видобутку після 2010 року. So the problem with that um, is that the well that you're, you're uh, injecting into is going to force uh, whatever you're injecting over to that other well. So it's the same kind of problem you have if you're just injecting into the middle well. Um, so they, people have tried this idea. Uh, and it kind of it's it kind of works, but um, what they found is that wells that are connected up, so there may be three, four, ten. There's a place that I know where they have 18 wells that were all drilled very close together, maybe a hundred meters apart, and those wells are all they need to inject into all those at the same time to raise the pressure because you want to get the pressure up to have recovery. So then maybe while they're producing those wells, they take the uh, injection go to a well in a different area that's that's isolated from these wells so you, if you have wells that are next to each other inject and then produce and inject into this one they they connect up and they cause the same kind of breakthrough problems that we have D does that make sense yeah, so because of, uh, uh, yes yes because we fractured these wells we connected them up thank you. yeah great thank you uh, my name is Marianne and I have a question about the depleted gravel in the US. 
what is the percentage of the good graduates in the U.S. and how effective you are on those depleted or on declining phase of development? Um, so all the reservoirs are depleted, <laughs> uh, particularly in the in the in the in the lower part of the U.S. in the continental U.S. They are um, in various stages of uh, enhanced oil recovery or or water injection. So most reservoirs, there's some type of water injection where they've injected for 30, 40 years. So the most of the production is water. Maybe you know of 100 barrels, 98 is water, and two barrels are oil. Um, so some of these places they go and they implement some other type of EOR, some gas injection or uh, surfactant floods. But even in those cases, they go from 98 barrel, uh, two barrels of oil to maybe 10 barrels of oil. So they're still producing a lot of water. And um, so the conventional reservoirs are are are. Are, are not over, but there's nothing new going on there, and so um, uh, I mean there there are people that are investing uh, in CO2 in particular. CO2 injection is 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 very popular in in, in conventional reservoirs, um, and there you may recover, you know, I don't know, maybe 50 percent more. So if you already produced you know a million barrels from the field, you might get another. Two, three, four hundred, five hundred thousand barrels, um, uh, but you need access to CO two, and that can be a problem that's hard to um, to 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 have. So, so, I don't know if that answered your question, but you know we're, they're all depleted. I don't know. Probably in Ukraine, maybe similar kind of um, things. So the, the exciting stuff is in developing unconventional reservoirs, these source rocks, the source rock reservoirs. Um, and I, you know, hopefully in Ukraine, this is something that they can start to do here as well. Uh, the the EOR potential in conventional in conventional reservoirs is there, but it's it's uh, it, incrementally it's a small number. I think it's uh, compared to um, what they what you produced on primary production. So, we went to the production of the і як добувати там газ додатковий. Пан професор сказав, що для цього використовується в основному вуглекисий газ, CO2, і вдалося на цих виснажених льодовищах збільшити видобуток до 15%. процентів. Uh, you potentially could. Um, you um, so if you had a vertical well that went past your formation, you could come up into that and then sidetrack that well and drill into the formation because our unconventional reservoirs we drill all horizontal. So you c could potentially take an existing well bore, um, cement it up, and then sidetrack into it. We don't do that mostly because the wells the, in the conventional reservoirs are very old. So if the well's been there for 30, 40, 50 years, the cement job, <laughs> the integrity of the well is very poor. So they're worried that they uh, have a hard time fracking this well because our fracking pressures are, you know, six, seven, eight thousand psi. Um, so for the most uh, exclusively, everything that I know about, it's all just new drills, um, but that again adds a lot of cost because you, you know, you have to drill down. That these are mostly two to three thousand meter um, formations. So you have to drill down through those formations, uh, but just for the risk, they they don't they don't want to take the risk to um, to to use the existing well bores. So. One more question, Йшлося про свердловини нетрадиційних покладів, які пробурюються бічні свердловини, які пробурюються з, традиці... з традиційних вертикальних свердловин і з використанням гідролічного розриву пласта. Питання було таке, чи можна використати існуючі свердловини так, так, для докування нетрадиційного? Так, звичайно. Відповідь була така, що можна, звичайно... Не ефективно, що... 
English. Yeah. First in English, you can bring in then in English. Okay. Чи на які приблизно в Литвині, в Сполучених Штатах цих нетрадиційних покладів? What are the depths of this unconventional reservoirs in the United States? I mean, this source. Yeah, they're mostly 3,000 meters. Yeah, 2,500 to 3,000, 3,500. You know, 10,000 feet is pretty standard. Uh, some of the gas reservoirs are deeper uh, because they are hotter, so uh, the temperature is higher, and that converted the carrageen into gas instead of into um, into liquid hydrocarbons. So maybe up to 4,000 meters probably for the gas reservoirs, but for the oil, mostly 3,000. Нетрадиційні покриди залягають в основному на глибині 3-4 тисячі метрів. Газ трошки залягає глибше, завдяки керогену, який робить його вращим. Йшлося про глибину залягання у цих нетрадиційних покладів. Дякую. Окей. Thank you. Лекція закінчена. Я дуже дякую всім за увагу. І хотів би анонсувати, що у грудні в нас буде ще одна лекція, тому вас тебе запрошуємо до участі. Дякую. До побачення.